Please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, and we will be looking at verses 1 to 8. Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. We know that Jesus came, the Word became flesh, and in chapter 15, He died. He was crucified on the cross, and He was buried. Chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, tells us about Jesus' resurrection. So the title of today's sermon is The Truth of Jesus' Resurrection. And we're going to look at three points. Firstly, the resurrection according to the scriptures. Secondly, the reliability of the scriptures. And lastly, the response to the scriptures. And let's look at the resurrection according to the scriptures, which is what Mark has recorded for us in chapter 16, verses 1 to 8. Christianity stands or falls on the historical bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If there's no resurrection, there will be no Christianity. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14, Paul writes, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. The apostles preach of Jesus' resurrection. They went around Jerusalem and then to the ends of the world, recording in the book of Acts, as they went around, they proclaimed the resurrected Christ, the risen Lord. In fact, the chief priests, the Pharisees and scribes tried to prevent the disciples from preaching about the resurrected Lord. So it is clear from Scripture that if there is no resurrection, then there is no Christianity and whatever that we believed in, if it is only for this life, Paul says we are of all people most to be pitied. Throughout the Gospel, we know that Jesus talked about his death and his resurrection. This was not a surprised ending. In the beginning of his ministry, Mark chapter 1, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent from what? Repent from sin. All men are sinners. And when Jesus came, he came for the purpose of bearing the sins of men on the cross. And in the past few sermons on Mark, when we saw how he died on the cross, for what reason he died on the cross, we knew that it is for our sin that Jesus died on the cross. He bore our sins on the cross and he bore God's wrath on sin. He bore God's punishment on sin. 
on the cross, on our behalf, he died. But if Jesus died for our sin and paid the penalty for our sin, but if there is no resurrection, there will be no hope of salvation. It just means that we will not receive punishment, but there is no hope of the future life. Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is good news. The good news of Jesus' death and his resurrection that gives us hope, hope of eternal life. In times of war, which we know is happening right now on the other side of the world, when people are not expecting it, there's war, there's death. Even when there's no war, there will still be death. There will be illness leading to death, accidents, or just plainly because of old age. There is death, and this is certain for everyone. So if there's no hope of life after death, then our lives are really in vain. Why do we do everything that we do if the end is only going to be death? So Jesus said right at the beginning, repent and believe in the gospel, the good news. And throughout the entire gospel, he continues. When he was asked, why doesn't his disciples fast? Jesus said to them in Mark chapter 2, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Fasting is an, a sign or an act of mourning. And the bridegroom here referring to Jesus himself taken away, meaning he is going to die. So right from the beginning, Jesus has already predicted that he will die. But death is not the end. Because he also told them in Mark chapter 8, after Jesus asked his disciples, now who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Now it is after this confession by Peter that Peter and the rest of the disciples truly recognize Jesus as the Christ, as in the Anointed One, the Savior, the Messiah. Up to till Mark chapter 8, Peter and the rest of the apostles, they were with Jesus day and night. They witnessed all his miracles, but they had not acknowledged him as the Messiah. But when they finally came to this conclusion that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Messiah that they are looking for. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. This would have been his first prediction of his death and his resurrection. And following in Mark chapter 9, he continues after the transfiguration on the mountain. As they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead and his disciples had no idea what he was talking about. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. A few verses later, Jesus again predicts his death. He did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. So we note that over and over again, Jesus told the disciples about his impending death and his resurrection, but yet they did not understand and they did not dare to ask him. Mark chapter 10 Taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. 
and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. So over and over again, Jesus predicted that, and now all this is coming to pass. He was crucified. He was buried in the tomb of Joseph, a rich man. And the tomb was covered with the stone. So we come to this passage now that tells us of Jesus' resurrection, which he had long predicted will be happening. And there are two women here, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James. This two Marys would be the Marys in chapter 15, verse 47. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus was laid, where he was buried, the tomb. And so they came. Three days later, on a Sunday, first day of the week, they came with spices, wanting to anoint him. The spices were meant to cover the smell of the decay. And they knew exactly where he was buried, so they wanted to perfume his body in a final act of devotion. And we know the stones were used to seal the openings to tombs. These were very large stones, as verse 4 tells us. An average stone used to seal the tomb would weigh hundreds of kilograms. And some of these stones were square-shaped, while other stones were round like a wheel. And as they came, they knew that they did not have the strength to roll the stone aside. And they wonder who might do it for them. Verse 3 tells us that. And it is early in the day, so they assume there would not have been anyone there near the tomb to help them. And in verse 4, we know that the tomb was covered with a very large stone. And when they arrived, unexpectedly, they found the stone already rolled away. They didn't know how it was rolled away. But when Mark tells us that the stone had been rolled away, it was very large. What Mark wants us to see is the miraculous thing that has just happened. So this is when the women came, they saw the stone rolled away, they entered the tomb and found an even bigger surprise. The body is not there. And they saw a young man dressed in a long white robe. No doubt he was an angel. And they were fearful, they were amazed. They were astonished, they were alarmed, which is what Mark used to describe. The evidence is undeniable that the tomb is empty and that Jesus is resurrected. The angel tells them, do not be alarmed you seek Jesus of Nazareth, verse 6, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. In fact, the Gospel of Luke and John tells us that there were two angels because in the Old Testament, two witnesses will be required before any matter could be established. But for Mark, he chose to focus on the, the angel who spoke, the one who spoke with the women. And the women now had a new assignment. They had no need to anoint a dead body with spices anymore. It is now time to proclaim the good news of a risen Lord and Saviour who has risen and has left the tomb. In fact, the angel told the women, Go, verse 7, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Peter, specifically singled out here, which offered really a sign of grace and hope for Peter. And in fact, this undoubtedly tells us about his denial. 
Remember, Peter denied Jesus three times, but he wept bitterly. He repented, and now he needs restoration. Peter would be grateful to hear of this word from the women, instructed by the angel to go tell Peter that his Lord is risen. But they were overcome with trembling and astonishment, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Coming to the end of verse 8. And so this whole passage here is about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And on the issue of Jesus' resurrection, there are three possibilities. There are three, and this tree kind of like covers all the possibilities. The first is that Jesus' resurrection is false. It was a hoax. Jesus did not rise from the dead. It was a fabricated story. The second possibility is that Jesus' resurrection is fiction. It is just legend. It is just myth, which is what many, many religions are built on. A myth that cannot be verified. Or the third option is that Jesus' resurrection is indeed a fact and is therefore the supreme event in history. No man had risen from the dead and then ascended into heaven. And if the New Testament record is believable, if it is verifiable, then we will be forced to make this decision of whether we want to believe in Christ or are we going to reject him like the rest of the Pharisees, like the religious leaders of Israel, like Pilate, the Roman governor. So these are the three options. It's either false or it is fiction or it is fact. Many people have tried to give naturalistic theories to explain away the idea of Jesus' resurrection and they try to disprove the word of God and they want to find that Jesus was not resurrected and in, if they are successful in doing that, then there will be no more Christianity. Our faith, like what Paul says, would be in vain. So we want to examine the evidence these naturalistic arguments, they do not stand up to careful analysis. And virtually all these arguments have been abandoned. They have been substantially revised. And those who believe in these arguments, they were all of them selective in the biblical data. One of the theories that has been purported is called the swoon theory, or basically, it says that Jesus did not die on the cross. He merely fainted from the pain that was inflicted on him. And so the people thought he died. Joseph thought he died, took the body of Jesus. Actually, he was still alive, but he merely fainted and put him in a tomb. And then later in a cool tomb, Jesus regained consciousness. And after he regained consciousness, he took off the grave clothes and he moved aside the large stone that sealed the tomb. And then he came out bruised and bleeding and appeared to his followers. And so they were convinced that he was resurrected. So that's the theory that he nearly fainted but did not die. But if we read the gospel accounts, we know that the centurion the centurion who is a trained soldier, he witnessed Jesus' death and the soldier pierced Jesus on the side and blood and water came out. That's what Luke tells us. But we need not even go to the, those passages to know that such a theory cannot be possibly true. Jesus, after he was scourged, he was so weak that he could not even carry his own cross. And Mark was careful to tell us in verse 4 that the stone was very large and the three women had no idea how to roll it aside. So this weak Jesus, after all the scourging, if he had fainted and regained consciousness in the tomb, he could not have rolled the stone aside on his own. It is impossible for Jesus to do that. 
In fact, we also know that the Pharisees had requested Pilate to send a guard of Roman soldiers to seal the tomb with a Roman seal and to guard the tomb so that his disciples would not come and steal the body. So even if Jesus had the strength to roll the stone aside, how would he have got past the Roman soldiers? So this has been debunked. And then there's the hallucination theory that Jesus conditioned his disciples before his death to have the hallucination. It's like hypnosis. Jesus hypnotized his disciples so that after he died, they actually had the hallucination that they saw him alive. And so this is another theory that has been proposed, but this is impossible. Firstly, it is impossible for a mass hallucination to occur that all 11 of his disciples see the same hallucination, that the women see the same hallucination. And in fact, the Bible tells us Jesus appeared to 500 people at the same time. So it is impossible to hypnotize 500 people and have them all have the same hallucination of the reason Jesus. On top of that, all these hallucinations only work if the people the, or the person who is being hypnotized is full of an expectation. Then the person who is trying to hypnotize him will be able to will be able to use this expectation to try and condition his mind. But we know from the description of scripture that none of the disciples knew or even expected Jesus to be resurrected. We saw the verses just now. They did not understand what Jesus meant when he talked about him rising from the dead. None of them expected his resurrection. The women who came to the tomb, they did not expect his resurrection either. So this is impossible. And then there's the legend theory that tells us that all this is but a legend. Jesus' resurrection is just a story, a written legend to convince people that there is such a thing, to give them hope, nothing more than a legend or a myth. Now, this is impossible too because when we look at the description of scripture, firstly, legends are always full of fantastic details. Nobody will tell a legend that is plain and simple because such a legend is not fantastic at all. It does not cause people to get excited. When we look at the description of how the tomb was empty with grave clothes on the side, and that's about it. It is just simple details. Secondly, the fact that the Gospels tells us that the women saw the empty tomb first. In the Jewish culture of the first century, women were not qualified to be witnesses in a legal trial. And it is therefore astonishing that the Bible records that women saw Jesus risen first. If the early church wanted to make up a story, a legend, they wouldn't put women as the witness. They would put men, credible men, as witnesses. So from these records, we know that this cannot be a legend, but it has got to be fact. Such that the gospel writers, when they record it, they tell us about what exactly happened. And even though women were the witnesses, they faithfully penned it down, despite the fact that during those times, it was culturally unacceptable for women to bear witness. And there's the stolen body theory. This, in fact, is recorded for us in scripture itself that the soldiers who guarded Jesus' tomb were bribed by the Jewish leaders to purport this lie, that the disciples came in the middle of the night, stole the body of Jesus, and that was when the soldiers were sleeping. This is recorded in Matthew 28. Again, this cannot be possible. Remember, the disciples they fled after Jesus was arrested. They hid themselves after Jesus was crucified. They locked the room. 
They were all in hiding and they were afraid. They were normal peasants, many of them fishermen by trade. They would not dare to steal the body because the scribes and the Pharisees would have already requested that Pilate send a guard of Roman soldiers to seal the tomb and to guard it. These are soldiers. These are ruthless soldiers who would guard the tomb with their lives. Would fishermen be able to overcome these soldiers and steal the body? Is it possible? And then there's a wrong tomb theory that the women went to the wrong tomb. They went to an empty tomb that was new. There was no body inside. The tomb wasn't sealed. Now, in fact, you might think that all this might not be important. But until you look at scripture and you realize that Mark is very careful to tell us in chapter 15, verse 47, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. The gospel writers are very careful to tell us all these details because they want us to believe that the resurrection is real according to the scriptures. To them, it is no small matter. So Mary, Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where Jesus was laid. Plus, it was sealed, remember, with a Roman seal. So when the tomb was empty, the seal would still have been there. When the stone was rolled away, the seal would have been broken. There is no way they can make a mistake of identifying the wrong tomb. And there is the lie for profit theory that the disciples purported a lie. They remember that, the, that their, their master predicting his death and his resurrection. And so after he died, they continued with this lie that their master is now risen. And it is for their personal benefit. Whatever benefit it is, doesn't matter. But this is the lie for profit theory. And this again cannot make any sense at all because we know from the book of Acts that after Jesus was resurrected and he appeared to his disciples, they were at first cowards they fled and they hid themselves but later on they came out openly proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead and most of them died for that message that they preached now if this were a lie nobody would die for a lie they would probably if they stand to profit they might purport the lie, but until they are brought to the gallows, when they are going to be threatened with death, anyone who is lying, who knows of their own lie, would immediately recant. No one would die for their lie. And if even one person were willing to die for his lie, it would not be so many of them. We know that out of the 12 apostles, according to historical records, John was the only one who did not die as a martyr. But yet he was banished. He was sent to exile on the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. All the rest, James was beheaded. John was the only one who didn't die. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was also beheaded. And all these martyrs dying for their life is not possible. And then, lastly, there's the mistaken identity theory that the people, the women, saw the wrong person. They thought he was Jesus, but because it was early in the morning, they must have recognized the wrong man. Now, this could not be true because they didn't see Jesus now. They saw an angel. It was an angel who spoke to them. The Jesus whom they saw resurrected was later. But it was not only the women who saw Jesus resurrected. 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 6 tells us that Jesus appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, and then to the 12. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, <clears throat> at the same time. 
most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. When Paul was writing this, he is calling upon all these people who were witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And we said earlier on, it is not possible for so many people to mass hallucinate together. They all saw Jesus. And when Paul was writing this, many of them were still alive. And Paul was really inviting his readers to go and ask these witnesses. They could still find them alive at that time. But of course not in our time. This was written 2,000 years ago. Yet, when Paul was writing this, many of these witnesses were alive and they saw the resurrected Lord. And that's what gives them hope. That's what gives them courage and strength to withstand persecution, to withstand death, because they know that there is another life coming. There is the promise eternal life. There is the promise resurrection in the future for believers because Christ being resurrected shows that this is indeed true. In fact, if we further think of the evidence, all the religious leaders and the Romans needed to do was to produce Jesus' body. If they could produce Jesus' body, Case closed. Christianity, false. Resurrection, no such thing. But where was the body? They couldn't find the body. So they had to purport that lie that the disciples came in the middle of the night to steal the body. So it is a fact that Jesus' body could not be found. It is a fact that Jesus is indeed resurrected. Further, we have the conversion of Jesus' brothers and Paul as evidence. James and also Jude, they were half-brothers of Jesus, as in they were born by Mary and Joseph, but we know Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit, conceived by the Holy Spirit. So James at first did not believe in Jesus. Jude as well. Jude was the writer of the epistle of Jude. John 7, 5 tells us, for not even his brothers believed in him. That was when Jesus was still alive. Mark 3, 21. They thought he was mad when his family heard it, including his brothers. They went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. So when, they were, when Jesus was still alive, none of his brothers believed him. Our pastor has been preaching through the Gospel of Matthew. Even his family rejected the king. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul writes that Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and James became a believer. He was one of the first martyrs of the church, recorded in the book of Acts. He was beheaded. And Jude wrote the epistle of Jude. And then we have Paul, once known as Saul of Tarsus, in the book of Acts, we read of Paul violently persecuting the church. And later on, he saw the resurrected Jesus Christ who appeared to him, leading him to repent and became an apostle. And he continued to share the gospel everywhere he went, in the end, dying for his faith. In 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Paul writes, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So we have this skeptic. We have this violent persecutor of the church who actually converted because he saw the resurrected Lord. Even more evidence, we can look at scripture. Any honest person who reads the Bible will be able to tell you that the Bible has such great teaching about love, truth, honesty, faithfulness, kindness, virtues, righteousness, justice, that there is just no denying that the Bible sets such an impossibly high standard, impossibly high moral standard. And this teaching came from the apostles, Matthew, John, Paul, James, Peter, Mark, 
which is writing because he was right. He was a penman of Peter. If we affirm that their teachings are good and yet accuse them of lying about the resurrection, it is not logical. How can we accept the liar's teaching? Nobody wants to accept a liar's teaching if you know that the person is lying and yet you can affirm that no, he's actually teaching a good thing. From all this teaching, we know that the word of God is indeed very high in his moral standard. And if we accept the teaching of the people, if we accept the New Testament's moral teaching, then we will have to accept the resurrection. So the resurrection itself is important. If there's no resurrection, there'll be no Christianity, there'll be no faith in Christ, and in fact, our faith is in vain. The resurrection verifies that God has accepted Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for our sins. As I said, if Jesus bore our sins and died, all he did was to bear the punishment. But there will still not be any hope in the future for us. But when God resurrected Jesus, it shows that Jesus has victory over death. He has overcome sin. And that gives believers hope. That gives believers hope in this life. As we face this life full of disappointment, full of suffering, war and death. What gives believers the hope to go through war, to go through death, to go through suffering? Is the hope of eternal life. Is the hope of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4. Paul writes, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that is indeed the first point of today's sermon. Jesus resurrected according to the scriptures. It is true. It is undeniable. And so when faced with this truth of Jesus' resurrection, what are we to do about it? And in fact, Mark ends his gospel here in verse 8. And if you are thinking, but what about verse 9? Verses 9 to 20. If you look at your Bibles, which is what we have today, the translated Bible, you will see after verse 8, there are some notes there which says some of the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 16, verses 9 to 20. And so, scholars have already shown clearly that verses 9 to 20 did not belong to the original Bible. And we are talking about the autographs, the original the writings of the apostles, which we actually do not have today. What we have today are what is known as the manuscripts. And that really raised the question on the reliability of the scriptures. How can we be certain that what we have in our hands today is indeed the Word of God, is indeed the Word of God as He intended it to be? And that's the second point that we want to talk about today, the reliability of the Scriptures. I want to introduce you to some terms here known as textual criticism and the difference between an autograph and a manuscript. An autograph would be the original writing by the authors of the Bible, the New Testament and the Old Testament. And what we do not have are the original autographs. When we talk about the infallibility of God's word, when we say that God's word is infallible, we are referring to the autographs which we do not have. 
and that might cause us to gasp. Then, how can we be sure that what we have today, the translated versions of Scripture, is indeed the Word of God? Can we be certain about that? And of course, the answer is yes. Now, what we have are the manuscripts. These are copies. These are hand copies of the originals. And so, the printing press, if you know your history, was only invented in the 1400s. Before the printing press, people would have to copy. If they had a document that they wanted to keep it, they wanted to read it again, they would have to copy it. And there are scribes, there are professional scribes, and that's what we read about, the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes of the Old Testament. They were the experts in copying scripture. And in case we start thinking, oh, that would mean there's lots of errors. The scribes, they were professionals. They have rules and standards, and they knew how to check their copies for error. And if there's an error, they will throw it away, and then they will start a new copy. And so, scribes, professional scribes would copy all these, the originals, and then what was then being transmitted are known as the manuscripts. In fact, ancient writings, not just scripture, ancient writings on the history, the history of Rome, for example, these are all actually not the autographs, but manuscripts. And if we believe in other historical books, if we believe about China's history, the first emperor, if we believe that there is such a person called Alexander the Great, if we believe that there's such a person called Napoleon, all these were copies. This is a table that shows us, oh, in fact, I'm sorry, the, this picture here is actually the picture of a real manuscript of the book of Corinthians. So these are the manuscripts, another picture shown here. And this table here shows us about different historical documents and the number of manuscripts that has been found which attest to their truthfulness. Levi, who wrote the history of Rome, he wrote that between 59 BC to AD 17, but the earliest copy by carbon dating and all the different kinds of dating technologies date the earliest copy to be 400 AD, which was found 400 years after the original, the autograph. And how many manuscripts do we have to attest to Levi's history of Rome? 150 manuscripts. Pliny, the elder, another Roman historian who wrote natural history. He wrote it AD 23 to 79. The earliest copy was only found in AD 1900 years after Pliny the Elder's original autograph. And 200 manuscripts has been found. Homer, who wrote the history of the Trojan War, writing it in 800 BC, Earliest copy found 400 BC, 400 years after the earliest copy, and there are 1,757 such manuscripts. The New Testament, on the other hand, was written in the first century after Jesus died and was resurrected around AD 33, and they started writing between AD 50 to AD 100. The earliest copy has been found AD 117 less than a hundred years between the original autograph and the manuscript. And a staggering number of manuscripts has been found, 5,795, still counting. If you believe Levi's history of Rome, if you believe Pliny's natural history, if you believe Homer's history of the Trojan War, then why not believe the Bible? So what is textual criticism? This is a science that the scholars, they would compare all these different manuscripts and they will then establish if there are errors. And of all these 5,000 over copies of the manuscripts that has been found, there is a staggering agreement between all these manuscripts. There were of course little errors here and there like a punctuation error or a spelling error. But other than that, 
this 5,700 over manuscripts has been proven to be 99.99% accurate. So what we have today in our hands is the translation from the manuscripts. From the manuscripts that has been put together and proven to be 99.99% accurate. And what about that 0.01%? That is like Mark chapter 16 verse 9 to 20. That's the 0.01% which the earliest manuscripts do not contain. So we believe that this is not part of the originals. It was in the later manuscripts. And so we can trust that what we have today, even though it's not translated from the autographs, but like I said, every other historical document that we believe to be true is exactly attested in the same way. So you cannot say you believe in one history book but not the Bible. If we are truthful, the only thing we can say is we reject it. Like the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, they can reject it despite all the evidence. So are we going to do the same? And contrary to what some people think, some people believe that, oh, it was the church over the centuries who decided which book goes in the Bible and which one doesn't. That is not true. If you want to find out more, you can read the MacArthur Study Bible, how we got the Bible. There are rules of how the church recognized the scriptures to be from the pen of the apostle or his close associate. And like I mentioned earlier on, the time span between the original and the earliest manuscript we have is less than a hundred years. This is much closer to the original than any other historical book that we have, which has also been established to be true. So if scripture and all the manuscripts are so close to the original writings, there's really no reason, no logic for us to reject it. And it cannot be corrupted within such a short time. And all the manuscripts have such a close agreement. So we believe that this is because of God's sovereignty that he has preserved the scriptures. He has preserved the scriptures by his power. Through men writing, copying, but yet by God's providential guide, it has been preserved for us. And we can trust that today what we have in our hands is a 99.99% accurate version of the original autographs. And the one about that 0.01%, it does not affect any doctrine. That 0.01% does not say anything about Jesus not resurrecting, for example, or that Jesus is not God. No, that 0.01% has no effect on any of our Christian doctrines that we derive from Scripture. And the canon of Scripture is closed. We need not doubt that maybe one day they might dig out another gospel of Thomas or a gospel according to Judas. All these are spurious, not written by the apostles or their close associates. In Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, John writes, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So the canon of scripture is closed. What we have today is God's word as he meant it to be. There's no extra revelation. And so when we come back to think about the truth of Jesus' resurrection, it is according to the scriptures. Mark tells us very clearly that Jesus is risen. The women did not go to a wrong tomb. 500 people did not recognize the wrong person. And the skeptics who were converted, the disciples who were cowards, 
they died for their faith. They died for the message that they were preaching, that their Lord is risen. And once again, this gives us hope. This gives us hope that as our body deteriorates, I know I'm not the oldest person here, but I can testify that my body is deteriorating. My eyesight is failing. My head is boring. Our bodies are deteriorating. And no matter how healthy and young you are, you know you are going to die. It can be war, it can be illness, it can be accident, or it can be just old age. We are all going to die. And if we leave this world without the hope of resurrection, then we have lived our lives in vain. Even if you have enjoyed a successful life, even if you have scored straight A's, even if you have earned your millions, you have a full family of grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you will still leave this world. The only hope that we have is given by God. Hope in the resurrection. Hope in eternal life. And it is not only in this life that we have hope. Jesus has never preached a message about enjoying life here. He talks about suffering. You must be willing to suffer as a disciple. You must be willing to take up your cross and follow Jesus. And only if we repent from our sins, believe in the scriptures according to what is written, then we have hope of eternal life. So what is our response to the scriptures? Luke 16, verse 30. The rich man who died in Hades, he said to Abraham to send Lazarus, if you remember that story recorded in Luke. The rich man asked Abraham, send Lazarus to go to his brothers who are still alive. If someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But Abraham said to the rich man, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Moses and the prophets refers to the Old Testament, which for our application refers to the Bible. It is not God's will that we should see the resurrected Jesus, but we have been warned in Scripture that if we do not believe what the Bible says, even when we see the resurrected Jesus, we will still not believe. So do not harden your hearts. Do not think to yourselves that if only I see Jesus, I will believe. No, you won't. That's what the Bible says. It's not what I say. If you believe because of the scriptures, if you believe in the resurrection because of what is written in the Gospels, because of what is written in 1 Corinthians, that's what will please God. That's what true faith is all about. Believing even though you do not see. So what is our response to the scriptures? We need to subscribe to it. As in believe it, hold on to it. We need to study it. Know what it says. And then we need to submit to it. We need to obey the scriptures. Scripture says that we are to repent. We are to live our lives for Him. And we are to share it. Scripture says, go preach the gospel so that the lost will have hope. So that those who are spiritually dead might also repent from their sins, believe in Jesus, and they will have hope of eternal life. It is not for us to keep to ourselves. So Mark ends his gospel abruptly in verse 8. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And it is as if Mark wants us to think of what we want to do after this. 
after we read how or after his audience. Mark, if we recall, wrote for the persecuted church in Rome. They were living in fear because persecution was happening to them. So it is as if Mark wants his Roman readers to think, are they going to be like these women who fled and then hid and said nothing to anyone for they were afraid? Or are they going to take the message and preach it to those who are suffering just like them? It's like the churches that we read about in Ukraine. There are pastors, there are missionaries who decided to stay and not flee despite of the coming onslaught. So Jesus is indeed the risen Lord. The resurrection is true and it cannot be rejected or rather it cannot be denied. It can be rejected. You can reject Jesus, you can reject the resurrection, but you cannot ignore it. Because if Jesus indeed rose from the dead, it demands a response. How would you respond to the risen Lord and the King of the universe? Even though you have not seen him, but you believe the scriptures. And do we know whether the women actually went in the end to preach or to share, to tell everyone else? We do. Because Matthew and Luke tells us that they went to tell the disciples. Obviously, they were fearful. Mark chose to end his gospel here. But Matthew and Luke tells us that the women actually did go in the end to tell the disciples. I'm sure they were fearful when they were doing that. They did not know what was happening. All these things were happening so fast. So what is our response? We need to believe the scriptures and we need to obey it. Let's close in prayer. Father, we want to thank you for your word. Help us that we would not be like those who harden their hearts, who demand sign after sign after sign, and yet still refuse to believe and reject. Help us to believe the resurrection according to the scriptures. And indeed, may this give us hope to face this life. And we pray for the people of Ukraine, especially for the Christians, that they will have the hope of eternal life so that whatever happens, Lord, they will hold on to this hope knowing that they will have a reward in heaven and may they not fear death and may they bring glory to you in this trying time by being good witnesses and we pray, Lord, that you also bless all of us here. Lord, we are living in a peaceful place but help us not take things for granted for we too will lead this world it may not be due to a bullet but it could be with something else we know pray that you will help us to believe in the resurrected Lord repent from our sins and to believe in your word we pray all this in Jesus name Amen